haven't noticed, we've got a couple people on stage that aren't generally with us, but we are extremely happy to have Mr. Wheeler playing mandolin. Beautiful Wheeler. And maybe we'll see Jacob a little bit more.
waiting for you, trying to open our ears for you to speak what is true. Dear God, open our hearts this morning to be open to your message for us today. Dear God, I just thank you for this time of worship. build your kingdom. Dear God, as we take this time to bring our tithes and offerings to you, dear God, I just ask that you would bless them and multiply them. Maybe not in dollar figures, but in souls, God.
Today we continue on in our message series called When We All, uh, and it's uh, hearkening back to those, uh, some of us grew up in, in church and there was a song that we used to sing, When We All Get to Heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Charles. And, and kind of growing up in church, that was kind of how it was portrayed, that, you know, just kind of suffer through it, suffer through it, and then one day it'll be okay. And, and I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, that was a message of Jesus, but it wasn't the whole message of Jesus. The whole message was, how about let's talk about thy kingdom come now. Let's try to, let's try to affect this place and try to make this place look a little bit more like the place that we're trying to get to. Why don't, we, why don't we come in and try to make this place look a little bit more like heaven? And so this whole series, which we started way back on Pentecost Sunday, and it'll go through the end of this month, it's all looking at different things. Uh, how, could, how could we make that beauty um, appear here? How could we see the beauty that's all around us? And maybe if we did certain things or if we said certain things or if we thought about certain things or today we're specifically again going to be looking at if we were more aware of certain things how are y'all on your awareness huh dull right so my uh uh, I, I ran across an illustration the other day that I thought was absolutely wonderful, and it was this man by the name of Ken Jones. And Ken had been in and out of his office for a long time, uh, for a long time. And as he walked in, he looked over and he saw something that had been there the whole time, and he'd never recognized it. Have you ever done that? You know, something that's been there the, the whole time. And he looked over, and it was about the size of a dessert uh, plate. Um, you chubby people like me, we like to reference them to either food or something we can eat off of, but anyway, about a dessert plate, and it was there, and it was plugged into the wall, and he noticed that it was making a constant noise, a lot of, not a loud noise, but a constant noise. Um, uh, how many of you have seen things like that? Some of you possibly have a, yes, yeah, some of you possibly have something similar to that at your home. Um, but uh, and, and once again, there was, it was it was making noise, but not loud noise. But it was enough that you could hear. And it's uh, known as an ambient noise generator. It's one of those. Some of you refer to it as white noise. Uh, some of us will call it gray noise. There's actually a pink noise. Some of you, uh, if you have one, uh, do you have it where it makes the noise like it's a babbling brook or a, or a, huh? so you can sleep? What? Y'all don't have mics. I can't hear you. You have to speak up. But anyway, so so the, that's the deal. And so he goes over and he asks the the if you if you need to know something, you ask the person that's in charge. He goes over to the secretary and says, "Hey, you know what is this?" And she she starts explaining that when they first went in there, that they would have people in the counseling offices and they could hear what was going on. And so in order to to cover that up and make it where uh, you couldn't distinguish what was being said, they they got that and they plugged it in and and he says you know it just kind of blew his mind and he says I understand the concept but doesn't it have to be louder and she says no see it's not about how loud it is it's the consistency of the noise that it's a constant noise and when that's there it tricks the ear so that the ear can't distinguish what's being said Some of you are sitting next to ambient noise generators right now. <laughs> she, she raised hers first. But it, so, so this this whole deal is that this whole concept of one noise, one kind of noise, makes it to where you can't hear another sound that's being generated as well. And so this guy, Ken, it it all of a sudden came to him, and he says, no wonder, Lord, no wonder that I can't hear you when you're speaking to me. 
No wonder that I can't hear you because I've got ambient things going on in my head. I've got fears. I've got attitudes. I've got all those things that are, that are making, and they're constant. Amen? They're constant. They're going on and they're going on. Now, sometimes they don't have to be as loud as what we make them out to be. But they're there and they're constant. And because of that, it tricks our inner ear so that we're not able to hear Him trying to speak to us. Are you with me yet? If not, it's going to be a long couple hours. If you're with me, we can go ahead and turn this butter right now. You with me? Yeah, Wheeler's ready to go already. So in the... Um, in the, uh, in the Psalms, um, Psalm 46, 10, a lot of you know it. Uh, the first part of it is, says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Well, why in the world are you talking about that with this? See, there's one translation to where uh, they've looked at it and they believed, and it's actually written, it says, Be quiet and know that I'm God. And on Facebook, I asked you the question, I believe it's already come out, uh, what's the difference between being still and being quiet? Right? Uh, you, you tell your kid all the time, be still, uh, or BJ, but be quiet, yeah. Uh, you, but what's the difference between those things? And, and I think part of that is this, and, that, and it's telling you to shut down that inner, that inner constant noise it's telling you to shut up the music, or is it shut down the music? You've got to shut something, right? No matter whether it's up or whatever it is, stop that thing long enough and be still or be quiet and know that I'm God. And that in that time, that he'll speak to us and he'll let us know. You know, it's not that he's being quiet. We're just having trouble hearing him. Or is that just me? With all these things that are swirling around, we tend to lose sight of the truth that God is faithful. He's more than sufficient to meet whatever our needs are and that he's with us. You hear me? Are you hearing yourself? How in the world am I going to pay my bills? Or is that just me? How am I going to handle this situation? How am I going to handle that situation? And the whole time, God's sitting there and He's speaking to you, but it's that constant noise, that constant noise. And so I asked some of you, where, where's the place that you go in order to have your quiet time? And Kathy says, what's well, quiet time? Della says she gets on her mower. 798 Mobley Road. Really quiet out there. Bring your mower. I think that's why my mom, she, she loves riding. That, that's, that's her time away. Um, in, in, there's a gospel account, and it's funny because I've never preached these two passages together. There's a passage in uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 24. You'll find it in verses 13 through 35. It's the road to Emmaus. You remember these two individuals, they're walking along, and um, they're distraught. There's chaos. They're, they're struggling. They're, they're, their world has kind of been turned upside down. And uh, it's on Resurrection Sunday, and they had thought that they had hope. They thought that everything was going to be okay. And, uh, and then... It's not. In their mind, it's not. And so as they're walking down the road, talking about the stuff, this third individual joins them, and it just happens to be, three of you know, what? It's Jesus, right. It's resurre resurrected Christ, and, and the resurrected Jesus comes, and he starts walking along with them, and he sees that they're disturbed. He sees that there's a problem, and he says, hey, what's wrong? And I love when they turn to him and say, are you the only one that doesn't know? 
And see, I think sometimes that's how we come to Jesus too. We come to God saying, are you the only one that doesn't understand what I'm going through? And he's fully aware. He's fully aware of what had just happened. Fully aware. And he's also fully aware that the problem had already been taken care of. Um, these people, there, they, they find themselves without hope that their whole world has been shaken. And uh, this chaos abounds. There's nuttiness there. It's a lot like your house, isn't it? it, it or where you live. And so all, all of these things are going on. And then, but, but Jesus does one thing. He doesn't say, you fool. He just starts revealing what, how all the scriptures of old had pointed to him, had pointed to that all of this was going to happen and that it was all going to be okay. And I have to believe that these two individuals are a lot like us in, in that hard-headed, any hard-headed people here? Some of you should have raised your hand that just did not. Uh, you're you're hard-headed, and I'm sure that they were intrigued by what he said, but they didn't fully buy it. They didn't fully see the whole picture of, of what was going on. And it wasn't until they got there to one of the men's house, uh, and Jesus acted as if he was going to keep going on further. Jeff, before I get a email is that farther or further he was he was going to go on <laughs> past the house he, with that yeah out yonder he was going to go out yonder yeah yeah so he was going to keep a going and so one of the guys says hey 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 don't keep a going farther don't keep it going why don't you come and stay with me and so Jesus goes in and they're having a meal and and when it came time, Jesus takes the bread. He gives thanks for the bread. And he blesses it and he breaks it. And the scripture says that, that at that time, their eyes were opened. And then he was gone. But they turned to one another and said, Surely, as he was revealing all those things to us as he revealed the word to us surely didn't our hearts burn within us see there was something about when it was going on yeah 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 you know I, I, I get it but yet I don't see because the noise was still there even though and I asked you the question what would it be like for you to walk along with Jesus with him revealing the scripture see he didn't get it wrong he knew it. He was it. He embodied it. The Word made three of you know it. Flesh. Yeah, he, he, he was that. And, and as he goes through, but see, that's part of it. They had seen maybe the smaller picture, but I don't think that they had seen the whole picture, the bigger picture. Do you hear me? And I think that's how we are quite a bit. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, that some of you have probably heard of by the name of Robert Fulgham. He's the one that he wrote the, the book. Uh, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You heard of him? More of you know that than know the other stuff that I call on. And that's okay. Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And he tells this story uh, about uh, a wise man by the name of Alexander Papadiros. And uh, this individual, had, he, was, he was teaching a two-week-long uh, uh, seminar on um, Greek culture. And so he's at his very last session that he's there. So he's been teaching, 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 teaching. And so, you know, what? anybody uh, that's ever taught anything like that, whether it be uh, one class or... Uh, several classes that when you get to the end, you ask that question. Right? Are there any questions? And uh, Robert talks about how, how this man has taught for two weeks and there's, there's a lifetime of questions that could be asked. But there's total silence in the room. Nobody says a word. 
And so finally he looks and he does that thing and no questions. So finally, the hand goes up. What's the meaning of life? And of course, you know what happens. The whole room just burst into laughter. Except him. And he quieted the room down. And he looked as if, do you really... You know, is this a real honest question that you're answering? And the guy looked and nodded back. And he says, I will answer your question. And this is a, a paraphrase of what it was that he, that he uh, came back and he said. He reached in into his wallet and he pulled it, pulled it out. And then he reached into his uh, leather wallet and he pulled out a small uh, round mirror about the size of a quarter. And, you know, he examined it, and he looked, and he talked about that when he was a small boy, he grew up in a very poor, remote village, and that as they were going along there, that he had run across a broken mirror that was on the ground. He said it was a German motorcycle had had wrecked there, and so he went, and he started trying to pick up the different, the, all the different pieces of the mirror there. Uh, you know, when you're a kid, sometimes you find those... Uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? And so he went and he grabbed it, and he knew that it was no way, or if you're Bobby, yeah, yeah. All right, so as you go, and he was trying to pick it up, and he realized that he couldn't pick it all up together, and he couldn't put it back together, so he kept the largest piece, which he was holding in his hand. And then he went and he started, took a rock, and he worked on it, worked on it until he got into a perfect circle. And as a child, what he would do is he played a game. He found out that it would reflect the light. And so his game was to try to take the light that came in, and he tried to put it in the darkest, deepest, darkest crevice that there was something possibly that had never seen light, he tried to take that, and that's where he would shine it. It wasn't just a... I almost told you a laser story. <laughs> Do not point a laser at Alex. He carries, you know. Um, but, but, yeah, he, w he, would, he would reflect the light into different things, and as, as he went from a child, he kept it into the uh, teenage years, and he would continue, and it would still... And it, when he was bored, that's what he would do. And, and his challenge was, I wonder if I can get light into there, into that deepest, darkest recess. So then, as he aged and he became an adult, he grew into adulthood, then, then he, it, it became more than a game. He started understanding that there was a deeper story to that, that maybe that was the purpose of his life, that was the meaning of life for him, that he was to be the one to be able to go and take the light and shine it into the deepest, darkest places into the world, that that was what he was supposed to do. And he started to come to the realization that he was not the light. He was not the source of the light, but rather he was the one that was called to reflect the light. See, some of us, we start getting full of ourselves, and we start thinking, uh, well, and they'll even tell you, boy, you sure do light up a... Uh, room. Well, yes, I do. And we start thinking that it's about us, but it's not about us. It's about being able to take the light that comes and reflect that into the deepest, darkest places rather than just going in and fitting right in with them. They'll accept you, but that's not what you're called to do. But then he also started understanding that he was merely a fragment of the mirror he was that small piece, and that's why I try to tell you is I invite people at the end of this service, I'll do the same. Invite people to come and be a part of this because I can reflect into this area. Maybe Bobby can reflect into an area that I could never go. Maybe he's got a good angle on it. Right? Or he could create a tool that would that would make it where. But, but he started understanding that 
even though you're a part of it, you don't have to know what the whole shape of it looks like. You don't even have to know. You know, and with God, that's the thing. I don't understand everything about Him. I, I think it's probably about this much that I understand, but I know what I know what I know. And that He's more than faithful. He's more than able. We start. We'll start not next week, but the next two weeks after that, we'll start getting into our story and how how to be able to tell our story so that we can share uh, share it with other with other people about what it is that He has done. Uh, in John, in the ninth chapter, the fifth verse, it says, "Jesus said, I am the light of the world.' But then it goes further, farther." I get an email from Jeff later uh, correcting all of this. Uh, but we are, to, we are to take that light of Christ and we're able to, we should be able to put it in the deepest, darkest uh, corners, crevices, those deep, dark places. And it says, let your light shine before men. Not so that you'll get the glory, but so that others will know how awesome, how awesome He is. Now, some of us get caught up in the fact that we can't see the whole story. Right? How in the world is this gonna have anything to do with that? And I care I guarantee you, if you go ahead and you give me all the answers, you make it all make sense to me all the way down, then I'll be able to go out and shed some light. Right? How many of you are waiting? You're raising your hand on the inside. We don't have to see the whole. We don't have to understand everything about Christ. We don't have to understand everything about God. What we are supposed to do is that thing that I have seen, I can reflect that out. That the light that he has shown me in the deepest, darkest situations, I can go and share that. Well, he's not, I'm, he hasn't finished with my story. Or I hope to heck that he hasn't finished with my story. That he's not going to leave me here at this place. I didn't mean here. You know, I'm hoping that there's going to be a, and they lived happily. Yeah. Well, well, you know what? Maybe, but we don't have to wait until we get to that point before we trust Him. So today, I hope that uh, as we come to the table, I hope that you will be still and know. I hope that whatever those things are, those inner fears, those attitudes that are in you, that we can be quiet during this time and not hear the you can't or you won't or you're not worthy, you, not hear those things, but rather hear the truth and be still and know that God's faithful, that He's more than capable, He's more than willing, and that God's with us. For us to be able to come to the table and, and say, you know what, I don't understand. I don't understand what the whole looks like. And it's interesting, and I asked a question, out of, and uh, I was on vacation, so I really didn't uh, go back and look too much. I asked a question on, on one of the Facebook posts. Do you think there's anything to the fact that he waited until he was there with the bread before they recognized who he was. Do you think there's anything to do about that and the connection with the Last Supper? Do you think there's anything to that? Do you think there's anything to the fact that he took an ordinary item and he says, this is my body that's broken for you? And every time you come and you eat of that, I want you to remember what it is that I've done for you. And then as the, as the cup was passed around, they had seen the cup before. They knew exactly what it meant to them at that time, but then it took on new meaning. And he says, this is my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins, of your sins, of your sins. And every time you come and you drink of the cup, remember that it's my righteousness, 
my relationship with God. And when you come with that understanding, you are found clean, you are found holy, you are found righteous, not because of anything that you've done other than accept a free gift. In the Scripture, Paul tells us that we're supposed to prepare our hearts. So let's do that now. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us the way that you do, that you love us just the way that we are right now. And as we come recognizing that there are things that we have fallen short, we, we, have, we have failed to do what we are supposed to do, and we haven't done what the Scripture has pointed out, that we're to love our neighbor, to hear the cry of the needy, We haven't done as individually or corporately as the church, as the body of believers, what we're supposed to do. And we ask that you forgive us for all of those things. And we come trusting that you see the bigger picture, that you see us for who we are. We ask that you pour out your forgiveness, love, grace, and mercy on us all. We pray these things in the blessed, holy name of Jesus. Amen. And so if we were doing liturgy at this point, I would turn and I'd say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Now, there's something I need. You can return those words to me. Glory to God. Amen. I'm going to ask the band members to come up first and then right at, at, with them. I need those that are assisting today. If you'll come on up. When we come, uh, we, we're uh, celebrating Holy Communion by intention. If you'll make a line across here, Jacob. Uh, we're going to... As the bread's given, uh, we don't come and take communion, we receive communion. The body of Christ given for you, and the response is, take a line across. The body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you, right? Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you, Lucy. Then we take the bread and we dip it in the cup. Blood of Christ given for you. 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 Blood of Christ given for you, Julio. Blood of Christ given for you, Ruth. Blood of Christ given for you. Since I knew it was going to be a smaller crowd, we're just doing one station, if you will. Uh, first, we'll go front to back on this side. Uh, if you'll come around this way and return back, and then we'll go front to back here. <laughs> 